Ernest Holmes was the founder of a spiritual movement known as Religious Science, part of the Greater New Thought movement, which famous writers like Joseph Murphy, Florence Sheen, Genevieve Baran, and Neville Goddard were a part of. Holmes himself was a student of Thomas Troward, one of the earliest New Thought authors and teachers. The New Thought movement holds a few fundamental concepts where each author expressed in their own ways. These fundamentals include that infinite intelligence or God is everywhere. Spirit is the totality of real things. The human selfhood is divine. Divine thought is a force for good. Man is the product of his beliefs. Sickness originates in the mind and right thinking has a healing effect. So this movement started in the mid-1800s with Phineas Quimby, who healed his patients by changing their belief systems. Ernest Holmes was renowned for being a prolific writer and a distant healer. The public would send letters to him to request for healing for their ailments, and Holmes would say affirmations about the person and they will be healed without ever meeting Holmes. In his book Love and Law, he described how he healed various diseases from liver problems, mental conditions, and other illnesses. He also healed his own eyesight conditions by using affirmations. His book The Science of Mind is a collection of principles and affirmations he used for various conditions such as loneliness, poverty, lack, fear, and various conditions. So today we are going to be sharing with you a lecture by Ernest Holmes titled, Let God Do It. In this lecture, Holmes tells us that we only need to think positive, affirm and believe in the higher power, and let the infinite intelligence do the actual work or manifestation, or what he calls a demonstration. Too often, beginners try to mentally and emotionally force an outcome and questioning why hasn't their prayers been answered yet, not realizing that forcing actually backfires and creates more doubts in their mind. Friends, in the Colorado Rockies, there is a beautiful valley from which many fountains gush forth. Each fountain is different. More water comes from some than from others, but there is only one body of water at a deep subterranean level that flows through each one of them. Here is a great spiritual lesson. You and I and everyone has a direct and an individual relationship with this thing called life, which is ever seeking an outlet through us. God is the original ocean of all life that flows through everything. There is a divine pressure back of us that evermore seeks expression through us. And if there were nothing in us that inhibited or stopped its action, we would be whole. Remember, each of the individual fountains in the Rockies is supplied from one body of water. And the water that gushes through each fountain has a pressure within itself that causes it to flow upward with an irresistible force. This can be likened to our own spiritual natures. We are all individuals, each having his own thoughts, feelings, hopes, and desires, but each being directly and intimately connected with the one divine life and energy and power. Each of us is a fountain of life. And yet how soon the flow from any fountain stops when something dams it up. Well, it is this way in our own lives. There is a God pressure back of us, a life force that is seeking outlet through us. There are many fountains, many individuals, but only one God pressure back of all. 
Our problem is not with the ocean of life, nor is it with the pressure that causes this life to flow through us. Our problem is with ourselves. Is our own channel clear, or have we blocked it? One of the most remarkable sayings of Jesus was that he of himself could do nothing. He said, it is the Father within me. He doeth the works. Could we not say of each individual fountain, way up there in the high Rockies, could we not say that the fountain of itself could do nothing because the fountain is merely an outlet for the pressure back of it? Now let's suppose that we personalize these fountains and give to each one the power to block the flow of water through it. One fountain might say, well, I don't know whether there is enough water anyway. I am not certain that I am an outlet for this great ocean of light. I am not even certain that I, that I believe that there is enough flesh pressure in it to keep on flowing. Perhaps it will stop tomorrow. Another fountain might say, I am so confused over everything, so uncertain, that I have just come to a point where I really don't know what's going to happen anyway. And another fountain might be so filled with fear that it blocked its own channel, while still another one might get jealous of the other fountains and gradually come to hate them. And let's make certain that these mental attitudes of the fountains actually could stop the flow of water through them. Let's make believe that this is true. Wouldn't that be about the way all of us are at times? Don't we become so frustrated with our little thoughts and our fears and doubts that it makes it almost impossible for us to let God flow through us with any joy of life? You see, our problem is never with God, who is the river of all life. Our problem is not with the divine pressure that seeks outlet through us. Our trouble is with ourselves. We are trying to be fountains all on our own, not realizing that each one of us is rooted in God and that there is a power greater than we are, a pressure against our lives from a divine source, which is self-acting. When Jesus said that a power greater than he was, was operating through him, he knew exactly what he was talking about. And because Jesus kept the passageway of his thought clear, this mind was able to work through him. Jesus never made any complicated statements. His words were simple and direct. For instance, Jesus said there is a peace at the root of your being. You didn't put it there. It was there before ever you were born. And if you'll only stop being confused, this peace will flow through you like a river of light. He said there is a love at the center of everything. And if you stop hating, this love will flow freely through you. He said there is a fountain of life from which your life is drawn. And if you will unstop everything in your mind that congests this fountain, you will be whole. This was the foundation of his whole teaching. Clear your mind of everything that doubts the existence of God. Live as though love were the great reality. Bless everything. And then accept and let. The difficulty we have in accepting the teaching of Jesus is because it is so very simple. Do we really believe that there is one life, that life is God, and that life is our life right now? What we are just beginning to learn is that we have so blocked this life that it seems unwhole and imperfect, for even God must wait our invitation to his presence. Suppose we consider another illustration from nature. 
And let's think of a great body of water high up in the Sierras. Now it is our desire to use this water to irrigate the valleys and make the desert bloom and produce fruit. We have learned that by a natural pressure within itself, which we call gravitational force, this water will flow from the high mountain tops down into the valley. But there are hills, perhaps there are mountains in the way. In the early days, when they brought water down into Rome, they built long channels around the mountainside. And, of course, this was done with very great and terrific labor. And then there came a time when someone discovered that water, by its own pressure, will reach its own level. They discovered that if they would connect a pipe with a high level, they could run the pipe down through the valleys and up over mountains and hills. And provided they never tried to make the water go higher than its own level... They could deliver it, deliver it anywhere and in complete volume. This was the greatest single discovery ever made in irrigation. And today, we couldn't get along without it. But there is something else we should remember about bringing water down from the mountain top. It makes no difference how large a body of water may be up there. The amount that will flow to any particular spot will always be limited by the size of the pipe through which it flows. If it is a one-inch pipe, we shall have a one-inch flow of water. If it is a ten-inch pipe, we shall be able to deliver a ten-inch flow wherever we want to. But in no instance do we force the water down. We don't push it, we don't pull it, nor do we draw it. It always furnishes its own pressure, just as though God were bringing it to us. But suppose someday we go up to open the head gate through which the water flows, and no water comes. What do we then do? Do we sit down and bemoan our fate? Do we lament and beat our breasts and say, Woe is me? Or do we say, well, perhaps God doesn't want us to have any water today? Or do we question whether or not the water is withholding itself from us? We know very well that we don't do any of these things. What we do is to realize that somewhere the pipe is blocked. And so we follow it back and discover that perhaps sand has gotten into it or mud or silt. And we open up the pipe and clear this out. Then we put the pipe together again. And at once the flow resumes. It is time for us to follow the pipeline of our existence back to its source. To find out what blocks it. And to loose it, to free it, that the flow may resume. It is time for us to let God do it. But before God can do it, we must clear our own minds of everything that hinders his doing it. We must keep the pipeline open and clear and let the water of life flow down into our lives. And remembering, remembering that anything in our thinking that is unlike our highest concept of good can clog the pipe. We must look to ourselves, and we must be very honest. If we find anything in our thinking that denies life, let us clear it away. We can stop being afraid if we want to. We can stop having resentments. We can stop all unkindness, and winnow out every doubt, and gain faith through the simple practice of learning to believe. And here is right where faith and patience and being willing to try and keep on trying must be used. Anyone can say to himself every day, I am a fountain of life and the living waters of God flow through me. 
anyone can say to himself, I will express joy today. I will be happy. I will bring gladness and enthusiasm into every experience of my life. I will maintain a quiet confidence and peace and a, a sense of serenity. And I will be glad for the achievement of others and rejoice in their success. And anyone can learn to love people if he wants to. It is this kind of thinking that irrigates the dry places of life and brings laughter and joy into everything we do. It can bring health and freedom where there might have been sickness and bondage. It can bring abundance and prosperity where there might have been impoverishment. But there is one thing more that we must remember, that is this. It isn't enough just to know that the pipeline of our existence begins way up there in the high mountain tops, into which the hand of God is pouring the eternal waters of life. For this is our inlet to the divine. This inlet is forever established. We have to be certain that we also are an outlet to it. And it is only as the other end of the pipe is kept open that the water can flow. This is why Jesus told us that we must forgive if we would be forgiven. We must love if we would be loved. We must make others happy if we would be happy ourselves, we must give if we would receive. Sometimes we hug our little good too closely to ourselves, not being willing to cast it on the four winds of heaven, lest it shall not return. But Jesus said that the very act of giving will at the same time bring to us a receiving Good measure, well shaken down and running over, he called it. We have a little more to do then than merely to clear out the pipe that leads to the reservoir of life. We have to let the water flow through us. And it is only in this flow that we shall find joy in life. It is only the one who gives the most who gets the most. And so let's learn to draw the divine substance down into our lives and as freely as it has been given to us, let us give it to others. Thus alone shall we be made whole. Friends, if I had time to read paragraphs from the thousands of letters that come to us every month, I think you would get the thrill of your lives. I know that we who have the privilege of reading them do. But, of course, it is impossible for such a great volume of mail to be sent around for everyone to read. The thing that interests me the most of all is the great note of faith and hope that runs through these letters. As one writer has said, and so truthfully, if people will only read and take heed, there should be a tremendous amount of spiritual awakening from the lessons you are sending out. And I thank you from the depths of my soul. Why should we think that these results are remarkable? We don't think it is strange that a chicken can come out of an egg, or that an oak tree can come out of an acorn, all through an invisible process of nature, which you and I know nothing about whatsoever. But we have complete faith in it, because we know it works. Now this is the kind of faith we need to have in this thing called life, and in the power greater than we are, that we are learning to use. And in affirmative faith, which Jesus told us is the way to pray. So remember, these lessons are not just something to be read, 
They are something to be studied and to be used. And please remember to write to us. We want to hear from you. We want to know about the results you are obtaining as you put this power for good to work in your lives. We want to know that you are joining with us joyfully in this great radio ministry. We confidently await your letters for this week. And so in this spirit of joy and confidence, let us take as the thought for our meditation today these words from Isaiah. Ye shall have a song as in the night, and gladness of heart as when one goeth with a pipe into the mountain of the Lord. And let us see if we cannot take the pipe of faith and go into the mountain of the Lord, which is the secret place of the Most High within us, as each says quietly to himself, I am one with the infinite and the perfect spirit, with the giver of all good and perfect gifts. I open my mind and my heart and my body to the inflow of this divine presence. My conscious acceptance of the fullness of the presence of God through joy and love flows out to bless those whom I would help, those with whom I would share this inner joy. And I decree that whomsoever I would bring into the scope of my thought is now blessed and healed through the presence of good which is within. The radiance of joy is in my own heart and it brings happiness into the lives of those around me. The, abund the abundance that prospers me is that which supplies everyone with the good things of life. The light that warms the center of my being so shines forth that all may find guidance and warmth and comfort in its rays. This is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into this world. This is the fount from which springs the living waters of all life. There is a power for good in the universe greater than you are, and you can use it.